Welcome to Content Breaker. He's Kai, I'm Kells. Of course, we're joined by Strangely Entertaining. For this week, we're talking about Bloom Into You. Gentlemen, how are you? I'm blooming. How are you? I'm, <laughs> I was I, I'm a blooming onion, Chief. That's what mm. I am. Best blooming type of onion. onion. Say, so I'm pretty good myself. Just got back from a certain place of the weekend. Got a couple of toys. <laughs> <laughs> How, how long Where's was that the like underneath in your lap? The whole time. <laughs> Where's the other one? That's all I'm saying. Right here. <laughs> okay, thank you. I should have I should have bought mine, but it's... That was the plan. Uh, well, was you got to tell me the plan if we're that doing it. That was the plan. It. You got to tell so me the plan. We planned this. So, Bloom Into You was the story of two lightsabers <laughs> who are trying to figure out their way in the world. One is struggling with the death of her sister and trying to come to grips with, like, who she is as a person and also likes girls. And the other is trying to come to grips with who she is as a person and why she doesn't feel any kind of emotional or romantic interaction with anybody. And these two lightsabers go on an adventure about um, questionable consent. Yes, and... You know, kind of figuring each other out and why they do things and who they are to each other. And does someone else complete you or do you complete yourself? It's very existential anime that I did not expect to find in like basically a mini 12 to 13 episode anime about, a, you know, high school romance. But that'll do it for you. The romance, the rom-con genre of anime is like... <sighs> Dare I say superior, because anything can happen. Like, anything can happen and anything will happen. But um, I definitely think that our main characters, you and mm -hmm. Suka, why do I want to call her Toko? <laughs> yeah, Toko. Um, you and Toko are just very much, like, refreshing for me in the Yuri genre, especially. Um. Because there's been more like with Adachi and Shomaru and things like that. There's been a lot more recently Yuri's that haven't kind of just relied on like fan service, I feel like. And I mean, Nana was like one of the first ones, of course. Shout out to Nana. Um, but then you do have things like, dare I say, like Citrus and other animes, which kind of <laughs> just rely heavy on the wow factor instead of like the emotional wow factor. Which, or just the fact that, oh, look, it's Yuri. Or, you know, it's just looking looking for that, like, you know, kind of that basis of like, oh, look, it's a homosexual relationship or other. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. That's, <laughs> but um, wow, with, this, so with this anime in particular, it does offer up some other existential questions, uh, as you said, that it kind of like, I guess it answers. Felt like it answered. It has a discussion on. Yeah, it has a discussion. <laughs> yeah, you know? I definitely feel like it's something that I feel like... I feel like you could see yourself in you's position. You can also see yourself in Toko's position. No matter, like, your sex or, like, gender or anything like that. It's very... It just happens to be two women together. Does that make sense? Yes. And I think it does that kind of just two women together very well. Like, like the whole point about it being a Yuri is less about, as you know, you said the wow factor or the surprise or the uh, exoticness, and more about here's a relationship that is immediately facing societal challenges, and we're gonna tell a story about it. And it's going to be from not only the angle of these two characters kind of feeling themselves out romantically, but also these two characters like figuring out themselves as individuals and that being a challenge as is the way with relationships, you know, because it always takes two individuals to make something successful. True. And and they both bring their own perils and struggles and challenges to this and the question is 
how do they help each other? How do they go forward as a team? Can they even, is it going to stay really fucked up in the don't ever tell me you love me vibe? Yeah, it's a whole deal. Yeah. It, it is definitely, it's definitely a deal. And I got to say, it was definitely, when I watched this, it was somewhat like, I think I just watched it the first time because I was like low key, like super bored. <clears throat> and I was like, you know, I want to watch some short anime, something new. So I just turned this on. It was on Crunchyroll one day. And I was like, yeah, this is all right. That I did not expect. Um, but yeah, I guess we can get into our characters. I guess we can start with our girl, Yu Koito first. Um, she's a first year student, like you said, who doesn't really know what love is and kind of doesn't really understand it. Why it's happening um around everybody but her like she's using her classmates and whatnot and she's like oh, okay well you know it it's it is what it is but it's not for me so she's she, she sees it she gets what like she's been told about it she knows how this is support supposed to work and then when it comes down to it she doesn't feel anything you yeah. know she she's been uh you know propositioned by a classmate and he's like i've confessed my love and she's like cool not yes thanks. not no thanks i need to think about this <laughs> and that's her challenge is like okay well i'm not like adverse to it but i'm also not like yeah let's go what is this lack of feeling that i am feeling yeah. yeah no. At first, it almost seems like, like, oh, well, this is typical. Like, oh, she's going to fall in love with the lady because, like, oh, taboo and nah. And that, that's, like, coming off of, like, expectations from me. But then it just doesn't turn into that at all, which was a very nice change of pace. But um, continue, Static. Oh, no, I was just going to say. And, you know, I wondered at first if that had anything to do with, like, her upbringing or, like, because she's, you know, very, her personality is, like, very, like, stoic, I would say. Like, she's very, like, she works at a bookstore and she lives above the bookstore and she's, like, very grounded in, like, I want to say, like, absolutes, but, like, reality. She's very, like, less extremist than Toko. Like, she's very much, okay, this is what we have, this is what we got to do. Much more of like a, I don't say like a realist, but like a, is a centralist a word? Can I make that up? It's not a word. <laughs> a what? A centralist. Like you're very yeah, centered okay. about Centralist. Things. Yeah. Or is that I like a say that- <laughs> foreign country, like suppressive group or something? I wouldn't say that's because of her upbringing. You know, she has a whole family and she has a sister who's, you know, outgoing and, uh, she has friends and her whole personality is that, you know, she is indecisive at the beginning, but once she gets into something, then she just goes with it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the indecisiveness at the beginning is the big question of her personality in terms of the plot. Yeah. And especially with like, (laughs) and I feel like that's like a big difference like, this story is just like, you know, it's weird because the guy confessed to her and she was like, I have to think about it. And then Toko just kind of like throws herself at her because she's not like obsessed with Toko like everybody else is. Like, let's talk to- about Toko. Yeah. So, who's Toko? So, Toko. Is our second main character, our notorious, if you will. And she's basically living, she's basically living in the shadow of her dead sister. Um, I know I got a lot. She's basically Ken Ichijoji, um, <laughs> from Digimon. <laughs> because, oh no, I mean, she is though, except <laughs> she's not like you know, the dark emperor, but so. Toko's older sister passed away um, when she was like a student council president or something. So she's lived her whole life trying to basically replace her sister in her parents' eyes and everybody else. So she's kind of become 
you know, like the perfect student, the perfect daughter, all that. And she kind of hides her true personality and who she is from everybody else. But Yoko, or sorry, you is not like attracted to that and kind of sees through that facade a little bit. So our girl Toko, the student council president, is like, yo, I'm going to be infatuated with you because you are not infatuated with me and never love me so I can love you. I'm just like, so edgy. So <laughs> much edgy. Yes, that is where the edge comes into this show. Where it becomes, oh, we're going to play at toxicity. We're going we're gonna to tease at you that this is not a, a mutually beneficial relationship. But yeah, yeah and you know, it just kind of happens to to be that. Um, but it's interesting that Toko, you know, has a best friend since seemingly she was little and she still doesn't show that who is the vice president. Um, she still doesn't really show that side of herself to anybody except you. And that was kind of weird to me that like how that happened just like off the bat. Like, I mean, it was kind of like, I guess like infatuation slash like love at first sight thing. She's like, yo, I recognize this girl. And she's like, you know, just, uh, you know, you have the animations of the wind flowing and all that stuff and all that. And it's like, oh, yeah. And uh, one, one point about uh, Sayaka, the best friend, is that she's only been best friends since they've both been in high school. Yeah. So, I mean, so she didn't she didn't know her back when the event happened with her older sister or anything. She's only known the uh, Toko in high school, the one that seems so put together. Yeah. So, but yeah, um, our girl Toko just goes up and like, you know, well, they're walking and she just kind of lays it on you, like kisses her. And it's like, he was like, well, spicy. He's like, well, that was a thing. And she's like, I didn't necessarily hate it. So, you know, <laughs> that proceeds to be a thing that happens whenever they're alone in the student council or, you know, just kind of in a room. Um, what got me the first time was like when it kind of switched up and you like initiated the kiss. And Telco was like, what are you doing? I'm like, girl, like, this is literally like. Run that back. When did that happen? When they were like studying, and I think they were in Yu's room or something. I believe. I think it was like episode like like six. early on where she was teasing her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was like episode okay. five. Yeah, it was episode five where it happened. Okay, where they were in the room and um, Yu was kind of like teasing her, and Telco was getting like kind of blemished, and I was just like, girl, like. Don't don't play. So it was kind of like around then where she was like, yo, like I can as long as you don't love me, we'll be fine. And I'm just like, oh, wow, like that is so toxic. That is like I had PTSD of like toxic things said to me in my life. It's like I and love you because you'll never love me. And we find out it's this dumb shit because she Elko's hates herself. Like, yeah, she's like, don't ever fall in love with me. Because I hate myself. And I could and never I could, love anyone. I could <laughs> never love anyone who loves the part of me that I hate. And it's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? That's, like, Yeah, no, that's some like deep emotional trauma. That is like, some how do you solve therapy. therapy? It's like, <laughs> it's, please seek therapy. Because please, you need like, help. Seek the child. most expensive therapy you can find. <laughs> that is that spooky shit. Okay. Content breaker disclaimer. If anyone you're trying to smash hits you with the don't ever fall in love with me because I hate myself and I will hate you to run, flee yes. immediately. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, is not worth is. everything that's going to come after that statement. Facts. Absolute yes, com facts. Coming more, from all more. of us here, like facts. If, if she hits you with the... I can never love myself like 
that's also a red flag because like uh, you that that is a, that is the biggest one of the biggest red flags i think you could even see if you're sailing on the high seas of love and you see that flag you better turn that ship around because this is mm-hmm. not like, and i'm like man it's just it, and i'm trying to figure out too like why would like how could you <laughs> like now in my infinite wisdom of like growth of age I fully understand. Having having been around, I feel it. (laughs) Yeah, having been through that, I'm like, what? Like, that sentence just says so much. It says, Mm. I don't even love myself, so how can you love me? Because, like, you're going to have to get over. Like, you're going to have to teach that person how to love themselves before you can truly love them. Because who are they if they don't love themselves? And that's the other thing that I guess I don't. Just general advice, relationship advice. Okay. From the content breaker. <laughs> Go ahead. Do work on yourself. Make sure you are okay before uh-huh. going to seek out any sort of relationship. Because if you don't and you run into a person like this, they will drag you down with them so hard and so fast. It's- or conversely. <laughs> mm-hmm. If you aren't okay, you mm-hmm. can't be a whole partner in a healthy no. relationship True. because the relationship is not the solving of your problems. The yes. relationship is making your effort more enjoyable. And on top of that, if you are literally, there are things you hate about yourself and you've hated them for years and you've not made any active effort to change them. <laughs> like <laughs> that says a lot about you as a person. Whether what that says is something you gotta, yeah, figure out for yourself. <laughs> Excuse me, gotta figure out for yourself, boy. Yeah, you gotta so, find out what what's causing that. And and yeah. the other thing I'm thinking about, especially uh, going back to the whole relationship thing, it is okay to not be in a relationship. Perfectly fine, perfectly okay. If you don't feel any sort of romance or some sort of way perfectly normal you're not crazy yeah you don't have to let senpai just kind of push herself on you (laughs) yes because i'm gonna be honest i think this is a toxic relationship like i think it's better (laughs) than citrus by far but i still think it's toxic up to a point like it's very much because i mean I get like you got to go through it to realize that you love someone and stuff. But there are like a lot of moments in this where you doesn't necessarily want to like do things that I feel like she's like. Kind of not. I don't know if like forced is the right word, but like pressure pressure. Yeah. By Toko, like Toko is not a good person, like for a good part of the show, because. And I don't feel like hurt. You know, her being hurt, like, overrides that. Like, her being in pain from the loss of her sister overrides her kind of treating you the way she does and some of the people that she treats around her. Because, like, I'm not saying she's a bad friend, but, like, if you don't give your friends the opportunity to love or hate you for who you really are, like, that's not necessarily fair to them because they don't even really know who you are. So they don't really know who they have around them. And that's part of the entire point of this, the story mm-hmm. is that Togo doesn't know who she is, right? So that's kind of the adventure everyone is going on through adolescence. Yeah. And and that's kind of the focus. Even though we're dealing with now everyone's of an age where romance is a player in the game. Yeah, which is... Um Definitely, like you said, one of the themes. Um, and that's what, like, I think the most prominent theme is, like, like you said, struggling to figure out who you are and living up to an idea. Like, Toko is trying to live up to the idea of her sister, Mio, which, is that her sister? Yeah, Mio. Um, which, you know, is kind of self-imposed, honestly. I don't feel like... At at this point, yes. But it's all coming from, you know, the 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 slew of of coping and and living with this kind of loss of a loved one who is meaning yeah. so much to you. And then the kind of innocuous in 
statements from family members at the time. We see, you know, uh, her sister dies when she's at, you know, a, a young age, 10, 11 ish, give yeah. or take. And all of her family members are like, you need to, you know, uh, live up to, you know, be the best person you can be for Mio's sake. You got to like hustle your ass off for Mio's sake. And that was all said in like around the funeral time. And now she's living with that kind of expectation that's been yeah. impressed on her that no one else even thinks about at this point in time. But she's living with that. She's living with the, okay, I've got to do whatever the fuck I got to do for my sister's sake. And that might just become being a replacement for my sister. Mm hmm. Which is super sad, but um, it's real, you know? A lot of people, I feel like in life, go through things where they feel like they have to, you know, replace someone else that loses them because of, like, you know, their duty to others. Like, I joked, but, like, a really good comparison is also, like, you know, Ken Ichijoji from Digimon, where, like, he became a genius soccer star because that's what his brother was. And he became crazy and became Digimon Ember on the other side, on like the split side. So it makes me wonder, you know, if you hadn't come along or if like we saw more of this part of Toko, like if she has a like part of her that is just kind of like out of control or is like her relationship towards you that part, I like guess that her escape from, you know, her version of Tokyo that is Mia is like her, like, is she really in love with you or is this just her being in lust with something else to distract her from her constant act that she has to keep up? That's an interesting question, um, which, you know, the, the, the bubbly happy side <laughs> says it's not just her being in lust with another thing to distract from her inevitabilities. Um, and that like kind of the way that the show portrays it is that her relationship with you is really the only time that Toko Nanami is recognized for herself. Mm -hmm. Like every other relationship, whether intentionally or unintentionally, is just Toko's portraying what she has to be. Or her ideal, you know, with her parents, it's I'm going to go be the best student and replace my sister with her, her, her peers and her classmates. It's I'm going to be the best motherfucker because no one else can only I can be this great. So I'm going to hustle my ass off and I'm going to be this great. I have to be special where, you know, with you. She can be whoever she is she doesn't have to put on the facade she doesn't have to put on the front and she can experience which the issue being and the reason this relationship gets toxic is because telco is not prepared to comprehend what that means to mm -hmm. comprehend and and accept laying down the facade and it not being a secret that she is you know not what she wants to portray. She's not perfect. And at the beginning of it, that's that's vital. Like the whole you relationship and and more so than just the whole uh, romantic side is just having someone to show weakness and have be a, a shoulder to lean on. I agree. And and the whole arc with Toko is we have this whole setup where she's she's taking on the challenge of living up to an ideal about you know replacing her sister and her sister's like this this you know perfect comprehension of a person and she's going to go be the best because that's who she thinks it, her sister is but what she runs up against is the fact which is a challenging thing to consider and really comprehend is that people are different depending on who they're involved with, 
what the situation is, what type of relationship is it. There are many faces to an individual. Mm -hmm. And to understand that intrinsically is a challenge. You know, like I had someone in real life actually tell me that they have a mask for every person they talk to and that they don't even know who the real them is anymore because they just wear so many masks. And I've been thinking about that for years ever since like this person told me that. And I was like, you know, that's not as odd or, you know, as I guess not even odd. That's not as like uncommon, but I don't think it needs to be masked. I think that's just how it is. Cause you know, with you all, you know, I feel close and comfortable with y'all. So you all see a different side of static than, you know, people at work see. You know, they see the work side. That's not necessarily me being fake, but that's me, you know, choosing what to portray in front of those other people. And I feel like that's only natural because that is part of like, you know, everybody doesn't get your whole self, you know, and you don't really owe anybody your whole self either. And I feel like that's one of the things that is love is letting people like see your true self. And I feel like that's also what Bloomin' to you might be expressing. When you think about it, excuse me, when you think about it in a more intrinsic way. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the comp one, one thing I really like about this is the later on towards the tail end of the episodes, you know, we're, we're dealing with this challenge of who is Mio. Who is this sister? You know, uh, Toko sees her as one thing. Um, her classmate who's come back to help direct and, the play, and, yeah. and the, help the play uh, practices go along has a totally different experience with this person. And finally, we get to the coffee shop where it's you or excuse me, it's Toko and it's Sayaka. And they're uh, they're just talking, and they're just like, "Yo, I know something's going on. Tell me about it." Mm -hmm. And then, and then, you know, we see we see Toko really struggling with it. Okay, uh, I, the you I know may not even be the you or uh, the the sister I know may not even be the sister that's actually real. And, I've been uh, chasing so, yeah, Mike. Something that's not even real this whole time. And Sayako's like, listen, whatever your experience was is just as real as anyone else's. Tell me about your experience. And that's the crazy part. That's the difficult part to like deal with things. You know, I had a terrible, tragic relationship with my father. But as I have grown into not needing him to be my dad, like seeing him as a man, as a worker, it's like and and hearing from other people who have dealt with him in that facet, it's like, man. So he was an only asshole to me. Uh no. Um but no, like seeing other people's interactions with them and mm -hmm. and the the frame of reference and that for one person, all of these experiences are valid. I really appreciated the way that that uh, Bloom into you handled this whole kind of story arc and and plot progression about this topic. No, I agree, like a hundred percent. And that's the beauty of the play for me. Like, whenever a slice of life anime has a play, I know it's going to be an absolute fucking banger because, <laughs> um, <laughs> like when. Like, Toko comes up with the kind of theme of it and how this person has amnesia. That feels like that's a metaphor for her, like, even subconsciously. Oh, yes, of course. Like, yeah. um, like, who is she? Like, and she's, does she take, does she believe, like, you know, her friends? Does she believe her family? Or does she believe her lover? And the fact that at the end, like, it's revealed that, you know, she chooses the lover because that person knows her, like, with the most walls down. And then I felt like, it actually, because we never get to see the play, but I feel like the true ending of the play might be that they're all real, especially when she gets this information from her friend, si um, Sayaka, because it is, you know, like who we see are like, we can't just take a person based off of one experience. We have to kind of 
encompass all of the experiences that we have with people to kind of get who they are because um, we all know a person who I have very complicated, you know, feelings towards. <laughs> and I love to rag on her, but, you know, there are things that I still, you know, appreciate her for. I'm like, yes, you're a great worker, but like your personal life is absolute ass. But does that take away, you know, your work skills? It doesn't. And, you know, like, it's kind of one of those things where you just have to decide where your threshold is for messing with that person. Like, does that come like you're a kind individual, but like you treat other people like crap. You're nice to me. So, but you know, I don't like the way you treat other people. So it's a no go or things like that. We got to figure out where our threshold is. And that's where we kind of meet that person. And that's how, Mm yeah. Yeah. Which in the in this show we see you know in the whole relationship in the, in the physical progression uh, with you and Toko where Toko's like all right I'll keep my hands off you until after the sports day but then you're gonna you're gonna give me a <laughs> reward you're gonna take the initiative and we get to that point and and use like I don't think that. I should be doing this. This is the line. This is the line that if I cross, we go into a new territory. If I take the initiative, things change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that whole thing of making the call about where the boundaries are. Mm -hmm. To which we see that go on and progress and yay, hooray. We don't get a solid answer at the end, but hey, you know what? We had a good time. Yeah, we did. We had a a very interesting journey. Um, And kind of the other thing, uh, just in life in general, going back to like the multiple faces thing about the play and everything, uh, being on this earth for as long as I have, I've learned that 30 years. Sorry. Almost. (laughs) You're fine. You're fine. You learn that you don't really know somebody until. You see the truth fart. comes out or to till they either show you who they really are or until the truth just comes out and you know everybody wears a mask and yeah. you know with, with with me personally I don't really open up to people that well uh, mm-hmm. I have to know you for a while and even this this new uh, club I'm advising for uh it's taken me a hot minute to get to know everybody I mean, just to open up, they're like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just quiet at first. That's all. And it takes a hot minute to know the okay. real strangely entertaining Yeah, to get there. Um, you, don't, you don't really but, know somebody until you figure out who all their roommates are. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true as well. Or until a uh, arrest report comes out about them, you know? So you just never really know what, what these don't, particular don't people fuck. are. <laughs> Oh my god, don't get me started on that. Uh, <laughs> y'all gonna have to explain <laughs> that to me later. Uh, later, we, we, later, later, later. Yeah. But uh, uh just I, I, had, that I, had, I had questions about myself. I'm like <laughs> Let me write that one down. Um, anyway, anyway. But no, yeah, that, definitely. You, you it takes time. It t- it takes and time to to get to know somebody and only only time will tell if they open up or if they want to keep secrets. And one last uh, one last thing I want to mention is not that I like to talk about it, but, you know, growing up in a funeral home, you deal with death a lot. And you especially don't know somebody until all the distant friends and family come out after a couple of years of whatever. Yeah. And they just show up at the funeral and like, wow, that was a completely different person that I had no idea existed. But they're all the same people. Because mm-hmm. humans are multifaceted, we just. We... Oh yeah, customer service me is not me yeah. on the podcast. <laughs> exactly. Yes, so like, <laughs> like bank static is not the static you're gonna get if you run across me in the streets. <laughs> like that is now. <laughs> uh, one one other challenge that we see with uh, the Toko kind of of story progression is as we deal with the singular goal, I'm going to become my sister. As we grow and we progress and we see that the perception of the sister is not necessarily the whole of the person, 
And that kind of shakes Toko's ideal. We then face the challenge of the reason that they're putting on the play is because Toko wants to do what her sister could, right? Her sister croaked before they put on the play. So now, seven years later, Toko's going to put on the play because she's going to be her sister. It's a whole deal. Mm-hmm. But now that her, her ideal of her sister has been shaken, what comes after accomplishing the play? What yes. does Toko do then? And this kind of spurs on into the other question about who is Toko as mm-hmm. a person, which, you know, plays into her relationships, plays mm-hmm. into uh, her romantic relationship with you being the, the few times that uh, Toko as an individual and not an ideal or a persona mm-hmm. is really happy. recognized. Yeah, yeah. So that that is another kind of theme of what do you do after your single goal in life of revenge <laughs> is achieved? Do you just croak? Do you continue to go? What happens in the long term? You defeat the world government. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then what, man? Then what? Then I, one um, piece will not stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a good question, you know, and it's kind of, you know, wild how meta it is that you know, that Toka has kind of like an end point of being herself, like a queer established. Like your sister's life only got to this point. So no one knows Mio after after the play. So either way, she's going to be addressed with that. And that also meeting the kind of climax of like you as well. You know, like, does she find her answer in you? Does she find like, how does she find it? She has to. Basically, you know, figure out who she is by this time or she has to, you know, kind of just decide on something. And that's what we see, like, you know. In the. Like, we kind of see her kind of feeling that like this when we get to episode 12 and that's kind of like the end of the series or the end of the anime, the manga. Thirteen? Okay. There was thirteen episodes. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and we see like she kinda gives like a different type of kiss than she's been given, you know, you the whole time. It's kinda like a more I guess like a true, like, passionate kiss opposed to like the kisses that have been happening before. And that's what I surmise could be wrong. But we kind of see that her like she's changing and you know changing for the better i would say and you know it kind of sucks that we don't have like a clear you know answer to a lot of this because it was only 13 episodes and it's still i still feel like we might get a season two because like just like kona suba's coming back for a season three and a spinoff series, so really, that's the first yeah. I've heard of that. I'm it's excited. also an isekai, so get out of my face with that. No, but I'm just the, saying, like, the we didn't think it would come back. You know? Yeah, the devil's a part also time. an isekai. Get out of my face with that. Hunter, Hunter, it? not oh. an isekai. No one ever thought it was coming back. Is is it? <laughs> yes, a lot of like Tagashi is writing again, and he's like a lot happened over the five days that we. we yeah. <laughs> Apparently Man. we leave the world loop for five days or whatever and everything just either goes crazy or sets back on track or what it Yeah. Maybe we gotta do it again. We gotta leave for another five days. Oh we are. I rebooked my ticket, so yeah, we'll plan <laughs> it out in another f- f- four months. <laughs> but um so like I feel like this could come back because overall it has a high rating on, you know, the anime rating sites that Zog doesn't believe in. And I'm, I mean, but, but is there more to tell? There's no more manga. There's no more light novel. That's it. I mean, there's more than this ended with. No, there was, there was eight volumes of the manga. There was a light novel series that says regarding uh, Saiki Sayaka. So there might be a side plot where we find out what happens (laughs) Uh, with Sayaka, yeah. which I would be good. The I'd be cool with seeing ending. I think for what I looked up, I don't know, man. I'm just looking at 
numbers, honestly. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Well, no. Yeah, you're right. Um, but, like, I mean, it's not like a horrible ending, of course. Like, it's not enough for me to be like, oh, I just wish there's things that, you know, we could have saw. And, again, you know, I feel like somehow every podcast I bring up Fruits Basket. But um, <laughs> that what Fruits Basket, like, literally delivered on everything that it put out and showed it. Excuse me. And I feel like that is one thing that plagues the slice of life. Like, I'll say Shonen sometimes get plagued by, like, you know, the big bad can never live up to it was built up to or things like that or something in their endings. But, like... Are you just mad about the, the, the punch of courage? Are we Soul talking about Soul the, Eater? Are we Soul talking Eater? about Fairy Tail? Like, there's so many no things out there that, that the punch of courage could, like... Uh. Um, okay okay fair play I, i'm not as well versed as you i guess <laughs> so <laughs> shoot are we talking about freaking new york show at this point uh god that may have made a better name but it's okay um so but i feel like slice of life is sometimes played by like the payoff not happening mm-hmm. like because if i look at some of my favorite slice of life is ones that have like clear endings and ones that yeah. like have payoff for me like mm. there's a large number that didn't like bunny girl is one of the very few where even though we didn't see a kiss i was still satisfied you know like because strange still gotta watch that we gotta we gotta put that on the podcast for these hoes <laughs> yes um, we do but like and it's just like i almost got that with this like, you know, I felt like if there was just a little more, but the fact that we never saw the play, the fact that they never really confessed that they love each other to each other, like, I felt like there was just things that were, like, holding me back from this being, like, truly, like, next level. Like, it was good. Like, the existential questions that we had that made us sit back and contemplate ourselves were done really yeah. well. But, like, what was the payoff, you know? It just... And... It wasn't like done in a way where it just left us with the questions. Like, I'm trying to compare it to another anime that just kind of left things open ended. Like, not even anime, but like Soul. Like, y'all, you both have seen Soul, right? Yeah. Because we did it for a podcast. Okay. <laughs> Kels hasn't seen Soul. <laughs> but um, in Soul, it leaves an open ended question like, what is the meaning of life? But it does that in a way where you can like kind of bring your own answer into it so there's no wrong or right yeah. and i yeah. feel like this I mean, is on the cusp of doing that but it doesn't do that which kind of like it's so that's like purposefully leaving it open for yeah like yourself to question and to think of like what your answer would be versus like well this is where we're gonna stop so <laughs> yeah. yeah as much as i hate the non-conclusion i think this did it incredibly well i think as much as I paid attention to the story and as much as I got, especially with when, you know, we had you go and be like, I, I want you to rewrite the ending. We're the one that is currently being seen. The one with amnesia is the one that we choose. She's important. Mm-hmm. Fuck the past. The now is important. And like the introduction of that whole change is done in practice while they're waiting for the penguin parade. And it's this whole, you know, whole th- moment and their whole vibe at the at the aqua park. I think it's incredibly well themed and placed ending. But fuck, I want a solid conclusion. Same. I agree. Same. Yes. Um. And and I think this show does everything incredibly well, right? So one thing that I really found interesting was how they kind of tied together uh, the visual demonstration of loneliness, right? So at the very beginning and, uh, you know, through various points throughout, we see you and her struggle for feeling emotions and the desire to you know reach out and and feel and this is kind of the the symbolization of loneliness being Mm -hmm. underwater reaching and not achieving you know the surface not not achieving the feelings and to see that 
then pivoted into the final episode where they go to the aquarium and this kind of whole underwater vibe is shown with both you and Toko together. And it's no longer a vibe of loneliness and wanting. It's a vibe of a common experience. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a really nice visual tie-in to go along with all of the other shit we've been through already. I agree. <clears throat> I think that was done well as well. Um, I really like to see, like you said, that visual, like, and, you know, kind of seeing how things were animated, like how it was like, the screen was all like sparkly and glittery when they were having their moments and whatnot. And just kind of like, it looked, the animation in general was like very clean. Mm -hmm. when when you started to have feelings and you started to notice the sparkliness and the mm -hmm. stop you know the 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 whole you know slow down time and it's like oh uh, and <clears throat> and that the entire emotions as the viewer that comes with that mm -hmm. because the whole vibe is oh god she's catching feelings it's gonna ruin the whole thing we're going for right now I want them to be happy. That's all I want. I just want everybody to be happy. True. And feelings are going to ruin all of this. <laughs> and then we go through that whole arc. Yeah. yeah. It was a ride. It was a ride. And it was a good ride. It was. I enjoyed it. And I feel like... <sighs> I feel like we need more. But only because like we need to see the conclusion. But it was a fun ride, though. What you so what you guys recommend this to someone? Like who would you recommend this to if you were recommending this to someone? Not an asshole. True. <laughs> um No, I, I think this is a great example of romance. Um of kind of slice of life because there's no supernatural stuff, so we can get away with, you know, them not being like Bunny Girl Senpai is not a slice <clears throat> of life. Um, yeah, but you know, and, and anyone who wants to kind of focus on story and relationship points, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to storytelling, like there is no action. I mean, I'm not going to say there's no action, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's no, not a shonen. Yeah. There's, there, no, there's no battle scenes. There's no, there's no fighting. It's yeah. all humans living their lives going through human struggles and that is the interesting part and uh that's why drama exists that's why drama is so compelling that's why soap operas go for thousands of episodes forever and you know still be watched i still can't believe it <laughs> hmm. can't uh, believe i would it. recommend this and anybody who wants to pay attention to anime and have a good time true same same i recommend this yeah. to Anybody who needs to like feel something, this is a good representation of like I feel like the question of love. What is love? Um, baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> no more. Bum, bum, bum. Um, but no, it's a great, you know, a great iteration of contemplating who you are and like how to like what really goes into like love and the work and things of it. And you know, shout out to the beginning of Pride Month, you you know, so. Mm -hmm. Watch Bloomin' to you. Don't be a jerk. Enjoy yeah, it. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> I feel it's like not citrus. Citrus is trash. Not citrus. This is very done very well. I feel like with all yes. the existential questions, it should have been in the last month's lineup. <laughs> it's a great transition episode. <laughs> yeah. Good Pride Month. Um, it's like we did it on don't, purpose. <laughs> don't be a jerk. Um, of course, you can catch us not being jerks all here on Content Breaker. On all your podcatchers, we're talking Spotify, iTunes, Amazon podcast at Content Breaker or Twitter, Instagram, YouTube at Content Breaker as well. Gentlemen, y'all have stuff too? Yes, you can find me at Static Treads with a Z because I'm cool and because <laughs> I have a Twitter. Hell yeah. You can yeah. find me on Twitter as well at Strangely Int, Strangely ENT, uh, where I do stuff occasionally. I don't know, I'll just tweet stuff. And then I'm um, also on YouTube. Look for Strangely Entertaining. And don't forget to follow me on Twitch where Tuesdays at 9 o'clock once the once once uh, uh, Central Time 
once the schedule gets back on track, that'll be a thing. I promise. Cute. Tuesdays? Tuesdays, 9 o'clock Central Time. Yes. Oh, that was yesterday. Okay. So of next course. week. Yes. Great. Yes. And of course, sketch the other product for more anime hot mess at your typical Shona protagonist. All your podcatchers, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Your typical Shona protagonist. We have something on the docket for next yes. week. It is Revolutionary yep. Girl Utena. Oh my God. I'm so excited. <laughs> Me too. So I have no idea that's... what I'll be watching, but yes. <laughs> You'll, You'll be, be watching, watching greatness. <laughs> yeah. It's a ride, bro. You better watch it. Like It looks like a ride. Give yourself <laughs> ample time because it's it's good. It's yeah, 39 episodes. <laughs> watch the intro and be amazed. <laughs> be amazed at the amazing anime intro. Yes, <laughs> in the in that order. Alright, we'll catch y'all next week on Content Breaker. Bye. Bye.